you can't replace part of the brain. Like, you can't. Treat them the same. The source of truth for the medtech industry. Coexists with the province. This robot understands things automatically. Number one show in the medtech industry. So Stryker got ahead of that and changed in the 90s, built a billion dollar company that helped a pie. A lot of things. The state of medtech with your host, Omar M. Khatib. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Really excited about this episode because this is the first time that I've actually had somebody on the show that I'm related to. So if you couldn't guess from the last name, Bilal Al-Khatib is actually a cousin of mine. So over 10 years ago when I left medical school and I joined, you know, the medical device industry, my father actually told me, "Hey, you know, you know you have a you have a you have a cousin who's actually in the devices industry." And of course some years passed and then we finally met each other at his wedding. Uh eight or nine years ago. I can't remember how long it was. And since then, we always hit it off. Bell is somebody who I really look up to and I see him as a friend, as a mentor. And more importantly, every time we get together, usually we, we've met up in great cities like Paris and El, you know, San Francisco and New York, other places. We sit down, we have dinner, and we always dive into details and rich discussions about medical device strategy, commercial strategy, sales, adoption, all these things. And I always say to myself, Damn, I wish I recorded that. Well, I finally was able to convince him that, hey, you should just come on the show and let's just have people get a glimpse of the conversations that we have. Um, you know, Bilal has served as a uh, sales leader at a variety of, of, of companies, a few of them that I'll mention. Um, one is Gettinga, where he spent a lot of his time, and then also Medtronic, um, and most recently, uh, Modern Pharmaceuticals. His core competencies are really focused around new business development and strategies along with digital healthcare, but specifically in the European and Middle East markets, you know, which I think are, are very fascinating and, uh, and also uh, Africa as well, because these markets and these countries are so different. So having a specific capital sales strategy and product adoption strategy for each one is unique and different. And so in this, we talk a lot about that. We talk about his approach to how he thinks about strategy and commercial adoption and more. So with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And before we jump in, a couple of quick reminders. One is um, if you're a medical sales rep, you're looking to level up your game, right? I recommend go and take my program, my course, which is the Medical Sales Network Effects program that teaches you how do you take a approach using LinkedIn, using email, very much like what I do in the past and what I do today with current clients and commercialize products using these digital channels. We have a private network that comes along with that course, along with some you know, weekly uh, and, and bi-monthly calls. So if you're interested in that, go to www.digitalmedicalsales.com. Use the code Presence Club Podcast to get a discount. And lastly, if you're a startup and you're looking for uh, a database, let's face it, when it comes to driving technology adoption, being able to understand who are the right adopters, how, what's the procedure volume, who, who are they getting paid by, all these details are important. The problem is that most databases are either clunky and too, you know, kind of difficult to use, or they cost a lot of money. This is why I've partnered up with Alpha Sophia. Alpha Sophia is this amazing sales intelligence database that I use not only for the podcast, but even for my commercial clients, because we do have clients who come to us who say, hey, we have, a, we have no sales force or a small sales force. Can you help us develop an outbound strategy and get demos and deals, right? So we use Alpha Sophia on a daily basis. Alpha Sophia has great, uh, great data on procedure volumes, prescription behaviors, right? Uh, societies that a physician is a part of, even brings in social media handles. So for me, because of my digital sales approach, I love being able to see what other social media uh, channels a physician uses so that we can try and engage them that way. So the best part about Alpha Sophia is that it's very affordable. It starts at $300 a month. At that rate, anybody can use it, whether you're a tiny little company that's getting started out or a more established one. And for being a listener on the show, you can go to alphasophia.com forward slash Omar. That's A-L-P-H-A-S-O-P-H-I-A.com forward slash Omar. You'll get three free searches. So don't, uh, don't take my word on it. Go and give it a try yourself. Maybe come with a region you want to check out or a specific surgeon and see for yourself what the data is going to show you. So with that being said, here's our episode with my good friend, my beloved cousin, Bilal Al-Khatib. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Uh, this episode is a very unique one. You know, most of the time when we talk about commercialization, finding early adopters and, you know, scaling your sales process, it's mainly to the U.S. But, you know, for a lot of companies, there has to be a global strategy involved specifically around Europe, the Middle East and Africa. 
And to be quite frank, that's an area that I don't have a lot of experience in. And most of the time, I'll be I'll be very honest, and this is going to be a little controversial. A lot of times when I talk to sales leaders who uh, focus on Europe and the Middle East, I'm not generally impressed uh, with how they think about commercialization processes. Um, there is one person that does stand out above all of them who I wanted to have on my show. And coincidentally, if you were wondering, like, wow, both these guys are devilishly handsome. They got similar last names. It's because it's actually my cousin. Now, some of you might say, Omar, isn't that nepotism? It's only nepotism if the other person really sucks at what they do. And <laughs> Bilal's the complete opposite. Bilal, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, we've gotten to know each other very well over the years, especially since I've gotten into MedDevice. I've learned a lot from you. I feel like every time we sit down and have dinner and talk about commercialization and, and the industry, I always think, I'm like, man, I, I wish I recorded that. And so that's why I wanted to have you on my show. So thanks for joining us. And you're, I think it's like 9.30 p.m. over there in Paris, right? Yeah, that's it. Thanks very much, Omar, for having me on the show. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah, uh, well, you're finally getting to record it. Hopefully the things I say are of value this time. Yeah. <laughs> no, it always is, man. It always is. Um, so before we kind of dive into it, because I have a lot of questions, um, maybe just for the listeners who are just getting to know you, can you give a little like one minute background on who you are and your, your career in the industry? Yeah, so uh, having left university as a biomedical engineer, um, I decided that my life wasn't going to be focused on the hospital environment and being a biomed there. I wanted to expand and um, my personality and my nature fitted much better with the sales and marketing side of, of medical devices. So my first role, um, I started with a small instrument manufacturer in the UK literally making scalpels and, and all the other bits and pieces that we use in surgery today. Um, and my role was to go around hospitals and, and do sales pitches for surgical instruments. Um, after that, I spent uh, some time with a company called ALM. And ALM was a French company who manufactures operating lights and tables. Uh, again, focused on the UK market. I spent a lot of time traveling around the hospitals, uh, working with the capital equipment side of things, ensuring we're touching bases with all the key people, key stakeholders at hospitals. Um, and so I spent three years doing that. Um, the company was then acquired by a, a Swedish company called Gettinger. And we were merged with a German company, which was one of our competitors, Mackay. And that's really when my career started to um, accelerate. Um, being of Arabic background, I was given the opportunity to be the regional manager for the, the Gulf countries, uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council. So Saudi, the UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, all of those in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, added to that Egypt and Syria and Libya randomly. As you find um, in these regions, things get to do get to be done a little bit more randomly, uh, and that's where I started spending a lot of my time traveling around, meeting distributors, uh, promoting our products, working with them to enhance our position in the uh, in the countries that they're working in. So no longer really directly responsible for the sales per se, but having to drive a team of people who don't report to you. Uh, who aren't paid by you or the company. Um, and so, you know, that represents a challenge in its own own right. So I, I spent some time uh, doing that. Uh, I then went back to the UK and was the division manager for the surgical workplaces division for Mackay. Uh, then went through several leadership roles as the managing director for the um, Irish office, establishing that for the company. Uh, then establishing the Dubai office, which covered the region, and then becoming the managing director for the UK, which was my largest managing director role with them. Uh, having spent five years in the UK, going through the financial crisis and all the fun that that brought, um, I had the opportunity then to turn my focus to Africa. And I was made the vice president for surgical workplaces division uh, in Africa. So really starting from scratch, uh, we had some business there, but really looking to expand and build the business in a significant way moving forward. Um, so having done that for three years, uh, I then had the chance to join Medtronic. 
a completely different field. I went into the implant world with the Medtronic spine business. Um, and then later added to my portfolio their cranial technologies as well. So the implants plus the navigation and the, um, the imaging. And then also on top of that, we had Mazor Robotics, which you're familiar with. Um, that was acquired and became part of the portfolio for us as well. Uh, after Medtronic, I spent a bit of time working in the local UAE market with a distributor. So distributing the likes or, or acting as the distributor for Siemens, Medtronic, J&J, &J, 3M, a multitude of companies under the umbrella of the local distributor and really focusing on driving the, um, the engagement in one single country. Um, and that leads us up to, to where we are today. Well, thanks for the background. So, you know, and, and again, part of the reason why I wanted to, you know, talk to you is that, you know, I feel that a lot of people, they have experience either like startup experience or like big corp strategic experience for you. You know, you've, you've kind of had a mix of the two. For me, at least what, what's most important and interesting to my audience is like new products. And usually it's in the startup world because unlike the strategies, like you just don't have the money. So you, you really have to be, um, you have to be very strategic and thoughtful about where you pick. And so, you know, we can go with any, any kind of device. Let's just say, uh, really disruptive, expensive, one of a kind technology. When it comes to the emerging markets and like things like Europe and Africa, Middle East, wh where do you focus on first and why? Well, traditionally it's always been Europe. Um, and the reason why is generally speaking, when you look at the wider environment beyond Europe and the US, the majority of those countries rely on either FDA or CE marking as the accreditation prior to allowing anybody into their country. So if you take, for example, uh, Saudi FDA, uh, which is the, the Saudi Arabian equivalent of the FDA, their first question is, do you have FDA or CE marking? So, you know, either you're going directly from the US to those countries, but Typically speaking, the the size of the market is not significant enough even today um, and is too dispersed. If you look at, let's say, the Middle East in general, yes, you have 250 million population, but they're spread from Morocco all the way across to Iraq, which is not an easy geography to cover. So it doesn't make sense to go there, even if you have FDA already and you can get the approvals. Europe has the population, it has the infrastructure, especially if you're talking about technology. Um, and depending on the type of product, CE marking in a lot of cases can be easier to obtain than FDA. So yeah. you, and, so and you, I was, really, I was like, um, just to kind of uh, like throw a little bit of a curve, curve at it. Let's imagine because uh, so on the regulatory pathway thing that's happened is that, you know, you, CE marking used to be the easier thing to get. It's actually just gotten like a little yes. bit harder. Yeah. So a lot of companies are like, well, if it's this hard to get in the Europe, like let's just go through the FDA. So there's a, quite a few companies I've seen that they have FDA clearance. They've done 510K or something. So now they're going to go launch. Um, I think this, the obvious answer still is, you know, start with Europe before you go on to Middle East and Africa. Um, would you agree with that or or? Well, I mean, I, I would say if, if you're looking at market size, you have China. And if China is okay with FDA and CE marking has become so complex because of the Euro MDR um, aspect, uh, then you can almost kind of skip that and shift straight to China. And even if you only addressing 10% of the Chinese population, or for that matter, even India, you're addressing 10% of each of those two populations, you're addressing 300 million people. Got it. Yeah, I, I would imagine also like, uh, I think like when it comes to clinical clinical trials and studies, you know, China and India are really great places to go. It, when you think, and again, just to make it easier, let's, uh, let's say surgical technologies, and you can pick any specialty that you want. 
Um, what are some of the favorite company, uh, not companies, what, is, what are some of the countries, I guess, in the Middle East that you prefer to go after? And how do you go after them? Do you go direct sales force, distributorship? Most of the time it's distributorship, but you know, I'm wondering, you know, how, what's, your, what's your advice to like a CEO or founder who's listening to this show in terms of how they think about that? So if you're, if you're looking at the, let's say, the, the higher end of technology where, you know, you need people to really invest, um, put skin in the game, as you say, in the US, right? Uh, you need them to invest. You're talking about a change management process in the way they perform procedures or whatever it might be. Um, you have to look at Saudi. Saudi has the ability to pay. It wants to generate an image of itself as a technology leader. It has a high level of um, clinical education. So a lot of their, their, you know, physicians, surgeons will train outside of Saudi and then return to Saudi and, and work in Saudi to continue to build the learning and the development there. Um, and so Saudi is, is the ideal one. Now, to the question of should you go to a distribution market or go direct, if you are a startup, you're going to have to go distribution because it would be too costly to be able to invest in that one single market. So, you know, if, if it's something that requires a heavy amount of clinical support and training, you would focus on maybe having one or two people established just to support those countries because of the, the demand on the, on the clinical learning side. Um, if you don't have that aspect, you work with the distributors and you uh, push them to make sure that your technology is being, um, you know, introduced into the right place. On, on the side of distributors, uh, you know, and again, I personally like international distributors a little bit more than the US. I think in the US, there's some, for every one or two good distributors, there's a lot of like, <laughs> not so great ones in my, in my opinion. Um, but overseas, you know, for, for a founder who, let's say, is new to this model and new to a certain country, like let's, let's use Saudi Arabia as an example. How do you recommend they go about evaluating a distributor? Um, let's say, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any sources online, website or anything like that you would recommend. I mean, how, how, would, you, how would you pick the right distributor? So, I mean, online is obviously a, a source, but the reality is you, you never really know enough about them. Uh, it takes quite a bit of digging. There's, you know, a, a Saudi distributor could have multiple businesses. So I've, I've worked with distributors. They're owned by a, a family in Saudi Arabia, that family is the distributor for Rolls Royce, uh, Mercedes, uh, they have their car business, they have their construction business, and then they have their medical business. Um, and then underneath that, you know, they, they, those pillars um, focus on their specific fields. You have to really be on the ground and be selective about who you're talking to and understand uh, what their ability is to open doors for you in, in Saudi Arabia in terms of access to the right people, in terms of uh, ensuring that the people are understanding the clinical value, they're engaged in the right tenders. Um, and so to find out who the distributors are, the best way is really to talk to people who've who've worked in those markets because they'll have a list. You know, to take your pick, take a regional manager from any multinational uh, company, and ask him: Do you have a good distributor in Saudi? Do you have a good distributor in um, in uh, UAE? And then you have to go one level deeper: Are they specialized in what I do? Because you can have extremely specialized distributors who say, look, all we want to do is be an orthopedics company. Uh, and then you have distributors who have under their umbrella, you know, a hundred brands, a hundred multinational companies. And they're just collecting because traditionally the way to get seen as a distributor in those markets was the bigger I am, the more I have to offer you, the more chance I have of winning the project. And that's shifting away from that side now, distribution-wise in the Middle East. Um, 
why is that you said you're shifting it's shifting away from that model yeah i think i think because to be specialized in that many things is difficult and the multinational companies also uh, depending on their specialization don't want someone who's a jack of all trades you know if you're an orthopedic company you want somebody who's focused on orthopedics not someone who has a large diagnostic imaging business in the capital world and that's their core strength yeah you want somebody uh, who's not necessarily uh, got their fingers in every every pie you want someone who understands orthopedics the importance of delivering a set where it needs to be how to manage inventory um, how to manage the consignments if you have to put consignments into hospitals you don't have that with let's say a distributor that is broader and of course the broader they are the less they are willing to focus on the smaller parts of their business because they don't necessarily generate the revenue um, or enough profit from the revenue that they do to make them important to a distributor that has such a huge number of brands um, so you really have to uh, pay attention to a lot more detail now with the distributor rather than saying this is a good distributor with a good revenue track record and Sorry. I recognize the brands that they represent and therefore I'm going to go with this guy. Got it. No, that, make, that makes sense. I mean, aside from, and I, com I completely agree, I think this is one of those things where, especially as a med tech founder, you know, you're, you're drawn towards like those, those ones that have huge size and everything. But even here in the US, when I've seen med tech companies uh, have a partnership with a large med device company as a distributor, it never goes well because, you know, you're, you're competing with so many things in a rep's bag, and especially if you're dealing with capital equipment, a rep's thinking like, well, I can spend all this time trying to sell this one thing, which is, you know, it's not going to be guaranteed to go through, or I just kind of sell the things that are high in demand, easier to close and everything. And so uh, I, I definitely agree with that. Are there any other things that, let's say, a med tech startup makes a mistake of when going overseas to the Middle East? Um, I would say that's the primary one, is the, the, the big, bigger is brighter. You know, there, there are actually a lot of, uh, very good niche distributors who are able to deliver value in a much better way than than those distributors and I, I think that's where the biggest mistake comes is there for for a founder i mean aside from, you know sometimes you see, you know you can meet some of these distributors at conferences but they often don't have like a booth so you have to seek them out is there an easy way um to look these, I don't know, maybe this, this, this is kind of actually a really good idea, a uh, Tinder for, for distributorships. But yeah, is there, how, how do you go about researching and finding these niche ones? There is, there is um, an app that was built. Um, I forget the name of it now. There was an app that was built to introduce companies to distributors within the Middle East market. Uh, but I don't know how many people know of it. I don't think it was marketed very well, uh, and I don't know how successful it's been. I, I, if I wish I could remember the name of it, um, but I guess that's an example of bad marketing, right? But yeah, <laughs> you know. About, but, um, and again, like this is at least my go-to, but I don't know how active people are. But like, what about um, looking looking people up on on let's say LinkedIn? Is that would you say that's a good good route? Uh, or, or not so much? It's definitely a starting point. You know, if you see people working in a specific market, it, it's definitely a, a good starting point. I think one other way to do it, if you, you know, you're a, you're a CEO uh, of a startup company and you have a very specific field that you're working on, uh, I think probably not so much attending big conferences, not so much attending LinkedIn, but for example, if you're in uh, neurosurgery, uh, look for the Saudi Arabian Neurosurgery Society. They have annual meetings specific for neurosurgery, and you will find the specialized distributors at those exhibitions. You won't find them at the, the Arab Health or the Medicas in, in Europe and so Great. on. So you essentially, know, 
special the 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 specialty and the national organization for that, especially within that country, and then attend that conference. That's actually a really good idea because at that point, even if they're not exhibiting, it's not a big conference. I would imagine for like the Saudi Arabian Neurosurgical Society, at maximum, what maybe with vendors and everything, maybe it's like a thousand people, give or take, probably even less. Less. Yeah. Yes. So you that's know. that's really easy. You can just technically show. So maybe for a founder, it would be worth to buy a plane ticket, buy a you know a ticket yeah. for that event. Just go to it and network and meet the people in person. You know, I mean, maybe give, give a couple of days afterwards just to have have follow up meetings. It's probably a good idea. Yeah, and Sa Saudi as well. Um, you know, if you have a product, you don't need a distributor to engage with a KOL. So if you engage with a KOL who's you know, well connected within their field. Let's use neurosurgery as the example. Uh, he is he is going to tell you who the good and the bad distributors are. That's a good point. Do you feel like maybe also like in terms of penetrating and and, and developing a market within the country, you're better off maybe marketing and finding the adopters of that country and then going through them. Let's say in Saudi Arabia, you you find like five great neurosurgeons just to kind of go through and see which distributors they use and then pick the one that's most commonly uh, mentioned. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily just look at who they use, but really question them about how good these distributors are. Do they meet your needs? You know, a Saudi Arabian surgeon uh, trained in the US or Europe uh, has the same requirements and same demands in terms of support and training and you know, all the add-ons that people don't see. Did you ask though? Sorry? Oh, what kind of questions should, should you ask? Um, are you happy with the service? If you're happy with the service, what are the key things that make you happy with that service? Are you unhappy with the service? What are the things that make you unhappy with the service? What's the quality of the knowledge uh, or the level of the knowledge that their application clinical support people have, um, do they stand up to the level that you require? So when you're in a tough spot, are they helping you out? Are they adding value or are they just box movers? You know, so you start to sort of move along those lines and it's the same questions you would ask as a rep in the US, right? In terms of, am I providing a good service or not? Um, and if not, why, and how can I improve? The demands are exactly the same. They, they don't change when you're at the surgeon's table. The demand is exactly the same at that point. Got it. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I'm wondering also in the Middle East, you know, like, so here in the United States, uh, no matter what device you have, there's a couple of states that stand out in terms of being very friendly to adopting innovation also because of their taxes. You know, it, you know, it's just easier to get people to adopt and just the mentality is there. So in, in the United States, it, you know, Texas and Florida are, are usually very good, not all the time, but usually very good when it comes to adopting new technology in the Middle East. Uh, who's, who's the Texas and Florida of Middle East, if you, if you, if you can put it that way. I would say the UAE. The UAE has a big focus on, you know, driving technology and using technology to, to improve the processes, the provision, uh, everything that, uh, that they need, um, and Saudi Arabia. Those, those two drive the adoption of technology the most and are the two largest markets in the small GCC area. The reason I don't mention the other parts of the Middle East is they are a lot more challenging. Uh, if you look at, you know, countries like Iraq, um, if you look at countries like Egypt, um, those are larger populations, but uh, it's, those populations don't have the financial uh, capability to really drive adoption at the scale that you would look to drive it once you've got your foot in the door. Whereas Saudi Arabia and the UAE, when they see the value of a product, uh, they will drive it for you. Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. You know, just to kind of shift it, just out of curiosity, because there's so many, there's so many more options and everything. When you look at Europe, and again, it's, I don't want to generalize here, you know, every, every country is going to be different and everything, but 
you know, everybody has their favorites, but when you're launching a new product, a disruptive technology, is there a specific country in Europe it's based on their culture, their, their mentality and everything that you, that you enjoy, you know, getting traction with first? I would have said traditionally you would have had, um, probably the, the big three, uh, the UK, Germany, and France. Um, but I think, you know, all of those countries have some challenges now financially, uh, in terms of the demand on their healthcare systems, um, the, the aging population. Uh, so it's becoming harder and harder to, to actually drive technology, technology adoption in a rapid way. I mean, you have to have really a stellar product that demonstrates immediate value and is unquestionable for them to introduce it. And they become so fragmented in terms of, um, you know, if you look at the NHS in the UK, you have uh, NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and it has to go through them first and they need peer reviewed papers and to study and to see the efficacy of the product. Uh, and so that adds in delays. Um, and then you have other agencies within the government who are looking to adopt and, and accelerate uh, technology into the market, but it gets blocked up by by other, you know, red tape that it has to go through first. So these markets don't really support, but they like to think they support driving the adoption of technology. Um, but I think they're far away from the ideal um, methodology of how to do that. And of course, you know, medical devices, it relies on evidence and the evidence also takes time to, to collect and gather sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, I would say in Europe now, that's a good question. I, I have to think about that one and get back to you because uh, honestly, I think Europe is, is a challenge, challenging place now for technologies. Yeah, I, I, I personally, I agree. And again, like, Europe was traditionally a great place to go, uh, you know, to obtain CE marking, et cetera, but everything's just gotten so much harder. And yeah. so now it's kind of like, you know, look for new markets. So I think like India is a great one, um, not just because of their, uh, you know, uh, interest to adopt new technology, but just the, the population that they have. Um, I think Saudi Arabia is a really not have the population, but I think geopolitically, if you, you know, take that device out of it, you just look at politics in the last uh, decade, I feel like Saudi Arabia has played played its cards very, very well geopolitically um, in terms of where they sit, you know, with other countries, how they interact with others, but also the fact that they're making just really impressive investments across the board, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I 100% mean, I, I, I agree. Um, you know, Europe, like we said earlier, with, with the changes in the CE mark uh, and the new requirements, you're slower to, to accelerate that adoption. Um, the other major aspect you have to consider with Europe, it, it's predominantly a social healthcare system. Um, so you're the, there are private sectors, but private sector within the, ma the majority of European hospitals is no more than 25, 30% of the market. So you're talking about 70, 75% of the market, which is uh, a, a social healthcare system. And driving uh, new technologies into that is difficult because the way that the payer pays, i.e. the government pays, is through a reimbursement. And, and that's a fixed reimbursement per case that the hospital gets for, for example, a hip surgery. You get X thousand euros per hip surgery. Now, if you're going to introduce a new technology, that the cost of that has to come out of the same amount unless you get a top up. So it's really challenging to, to accelerate technology if you don't have a strong private sector. And that's why the US is, is a very attractive market other than its size. It's not a social healthcare system predominantly. So that helps you know, in the sense that if a clinician wants to introduce a technology, they introduce the technology. Yes, you have the insurers and so on, but uh, it's it's an easier way 
to, to get things things through in the private sector um, and with insurers because they see the value quicker and can move quicker than moving a whole government and a whole reimbursement system in order to, to drive things through. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I kind of want to pivot just out of curiosity. Um, you know, it used to, I mean, I think it still is uh, when it comes to like raising money, the UAE used to be a great place. But I feel like in the last few years, just in terms of how aggressive they've been, everything, Saudi Arabia just seems feels like a great place to raise money. There's even a a, a meme uh, from, I think, 2020 or 2021, where it said, I showed like, um, you know, I think it was like a start of founders in like 2019, like, like I won't raise money anywhere else but the US. And it's like a uh, start of founders in 2020 and showed them in like in a Saudi, a Saudi get up and everything. This is a great place to raise money. Um, if you're raising money for a startup, uh, Series A or B, um, what, who, who's on, who's on your list to go visit, you know, country. You're, you're looking at the, um, the big families, um, that have multiple businesses. So normally, you know, you're talking private equity, um, on that side, uh, and then you take Saudi, you take the UAE, you can even take Kuwait and Qatar. Um, do, they, do they cut checks for early stage companies though, or are they mainly looking for growth? Because the, my experience, not with all fam, I don't want to speak for the whole Middle East, but my experience has been with some of these uh, um, family offices and everything is that they really just want growth stage companies that are doing five to 10 million ARR um, and they don't want pre-commercial companies. Uh, is that is that different now or it just depends? It's, it's not, um, but here's the interesting thing. So the the let's say, my generation and older are the people that you would define in those families. But you now have the younger generation who are all coming up uh, and they're very much focused on introducing the next big thing. So they may have a within that large family, you may have one of the family members who has his own investment uh, arm. And they're the ones that would look to invest in Series A, Series B, um, and then introduce because their eyes aren't focused only on the UAE anymore or the or Saudi, and specifically to drive and introduce technology there. Their focus is now: what products can I take where my business expands globally? And so that's a completely exactly. different perspective to the one that you would have seen before, where the older generations are very much focused on, um, you know, introducing the technologies into my country, developing the healthcare structures in my country or whatever, you know, business line they're in, that was their focus. The younger generation is very different to that. They, they have the wealth. They're looking at how they can exponentially grow that wealth. And it's not coming from you know, incremental introductions and, and growth in their countries. That makes sense. I'm expanding on a global level. For the Middle East, I mean, there's different uh, conferences. Like Arab Health is one, but it, I feel like that's like a massive one. What Are there any conferences that you recommend founders go to to essentially network with these individuals? Like how do they find, you know, uh, somebody who's younger within these families that has their own portfolio of investments that they want to do? Oh, there, there are a lot of them. Um, I, I haven't been to many of them because I've been very much focused on the multinational side while I've been in those markets. Um, but I have a lot of friends who are involved in PE, uh, VC, uh, they're at conferences on a, on a continuous basis. Um, and, uh, I can't give you an answer to that question now in all honesty, but I can definitely dig it up and, and yeah. share it with you. Yeah, definitely. And if you have, you know, for the audience who's listening, you know, Bilal's on, on LinkedIn. So be sure to connect with him and shoot him a message about that. I would imagine that like probably the safest bet is, you know, if I know Riyadh is a place that, you know, that a lot of these family offices exist looking for an investment conference that's happening in Riyadh is probably a smart way to go because it's local and they'll go to it, you know, yeah. um, you know, a couple of things I want to I want to ask you before we kind of wrap up, and I appreciate you coming coming on the show. Um, once you have established, uh, you know, 
some commercial presence in these markets. How do you go about, like, let's say, building a team? Uh, we, we've talked about CRMs and everything in the past and, and technology stacks. Like, how, how do you think about all of that? Because I think the other side I, I feel on when it comes to, like, international sales and commercialization is that sometimes uh, it becomes too heavy on the people side and over hiring. And, and you've always run, like, a very lean and disciplined team. So if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's, I mean, you, obviously you've got to get your feet on the ground yourself first. Um, but the key then comes with, um, first of all, the distributors that you work with. Because if you pick the right distributor, they will make those investments. How do you go about, go about hiring and structuring a team along with the technology that you like to use when it comes to commercialization in these markets? So you, you've got the tried and tested methodologies. You know, obviously, you, LinkedIn is a tool now that you're able to to use to to filter through and look for some people. If you if you know distributors, uh, you know the good people from those companies and the people that you would want to take over. Um, so that's one route. Uh, the other route is you know, spending some time again with your customers and just sort of saying, okay, who are the good reps that you have? Who are the good people that you work with? Um, and getting those names. Um, How often would you recommend doing that? I mean, because I think sometimes what a founder does is that they'll get a distributor in another country and then like send product and be like, hey, you know, we'll, we'll see you like at the end of the year. Um, so you don't want to do that at the same time. You don't want to be like, calling and you know what's what's the happy medium in terms of your checkup to make sure that things are in alignment and things are going smoothly like how, how, what's the what's the balance you strike oh, I, I would say if you're really serious about driving the technology you need to be there on a monthly basis you know that that and when you go on a monthly basis how, like uh roughly i know it's going to be dependent on the account the geography and everything but how long do you spend and what do you what are you doing during those times that you visit like what do you you know what kind of agenda do you make sure to have so i mean you you have to touch base with all the major um entities purchasing entities whether that's the the government entities whether that's the private sector groups uh whether it's insurers and payers who you know you need to get access to those people so you need you need the people who are going to help you access those people, if you're looking for, for funding, um, series A, series B, series whatever, um, you need to attend the meetings. Um, if you want to engage your KOLs, you need to spend some time with them in their environment. You know, the sales doesn't change wherever you are globally. If your competitor is present uh, and you're not, then it's a big chance that they're going to buy from your competitor. Um, you know, so so having that presence, firstly yourself, on a regular basis, um, at least a week a month, uh, you can do a lot of administrative stuff in the early days. You're not fully engaged on a day to day procedural uh, requirement, possibly. Um, but once you get to that, you need to have someone who can support you clinically. Um, you know, if if it requires a clinical cell. Uh, or support. So you need to work with, if you've got the distributor, work with the distributor to have a clinical person who's able to be there and support on a day-to-day -day basis when you're not present, uh, or ideally if the market is growing at a rate uh, that allows you to hire one, hire one and don't delay. Have your own person because your person can deliver that message uh, and support in a way that uh, distributors never will be able to. Got it. No, that makes that makes that makes a lot of sense. But I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Just real quick, out of curiosity, you know, I think um, one of the things that a lot of the uh, younger people who follow the show listen to is to kind of develop themselves. Um, is there, you know, are there any books or courses that you often recommend uh, your reps uh, to read and get get up on to kind of help sharpen their skill sets? I'm trying to remember the name uh, of the book now. You know, this is a really good game I'm good at. If you tell me the color of it, I might be able to guess it. Uh, never Split the Difference. Oh, never. Yeah, by, by Chris Voss. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great one. Well, t- why, why do you like that one so much? Because through my, through my experience over the years, the easiest thing for a sales rep to do is say, yeah, sure, you know, we'll, we'll split the difference. Um, and of course, it's never splitting difference. You're, you're losing. Maybe you get your commission uh, as a sales rep for closing the deals and hitting your targets. But the back end of that is you're compromising margins for the company, which can't go on forever. Um, and I think sometimes salespeople don't necessarily see that. So enhancing their ability to stand firm in front of a customer uh, as well, uh, I think is a big, big uh, thing that is is trivialized to a certain degree. You know, oh, they're just salespeople. They'll do that. And the manager's going to come in and say, no, we can't do that deal at that price. But if you get them to understand the importance of keeping value to your product and train them on how to turn that situation around, everybody wins in the long term. Um, And that's a skill that I don't believe is really taught that well. Um, And I think, you know, training is another topic. If you compare it to the days of, of old, uh, you know, people going on one month training in wherever country that their product's from and having sales training that's two weeks long and so on, that's all gone out the window. And I, I think there's room for some of that to be, be brought back, especially in what what is now a very much value-driven age. It's all about representing the value of your product and not selling it short by just taking the quickest win you can find. No, I completely agree. I'm so happy you mentioned that too, because, you know, again, this is something we've, we've had like many conversations about, which is, you know, salespeople kind of bending at the knee just to get a sale. And then in, in the long run, like it hurts the company because you get the wrong adopter or you're compromising margins. And I think that's a great recommendation, by the way, you know, it kind of reminds me, um, you know, again, on, on the point of training and education, it's, it's a continuous process. You know, I think at your wedding, we were talking, you had a uh, really good advice. This is a long time ago on success. And you said that like, there is no such thing as arriving, like there's no arrival. It's just a continuous process. So Bilal, thank you so much for- That would make me sound like a boring guy because I'm talking business with you at my wedding. (laughs) Not at all, man, not at all. Well, look, I really appreciate you coming on the show. This was so much fun. It's been a long time coming, so I'm sure we'll have you back. Um, Where can people find you online? Uh, TikTok, Instagram? (laughs) Instagram and LinkedIn. Got it. Got it. Well, be sure to uh, look up Bilal. You can look him up at B E L A L uh, Al Khatib. Khatib spelled uh, T I B uh, and not E E B. So, all right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I'm your host, Omar Khatib, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of the State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at Take care. See you next time.